Oh, it lies not out. <laughs> Hello. Do you want some water? Well, sure. Let me serve you. Oh, yeah. We're checking out our hostess <laughs> skills before we get started. Well, nice to see all of you. Uh, and nice to see you. Nice to see Isn't you, too. Yeah. Now, they just introduced your title. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit more your daily um, work at Apple? How does it look like? What do you do? Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I head up our worldwide developer marketing team in Cupertino. Um, and so on a day-to-day -day basis, we're managing the developer website. Hopefully, all of you go there um, for great resources. Um, our developer communications, if you hear from us, it's coming from my team. So let me know if there's anything you don't like. Um, and developer support, so hopefully you get great support. Um, I'm also uh, have the privilege of serving as executive sponsor of our Women at Apple in Cupertino. Um, and at Apple, we call our employee resource groups, we actually call them DNAs for Diversity Network Associations. Um, we love the acronym. Um, we feel like diversity is part of our DNA. Um, and so a lot of what I spend time thinking about at work is that intersection of those two roles, which is what are we doing and how can we do more to get more diverse um, folks into tech? How can we uplift uh, those that are underrepresented? How can we bring in more students? And so a lot of the time that's what I'm working on. Yeah. Um, I've been at Apple for 18 years, um, feels like 180. Um, but Started back in 2005 with Mac OS Tiger, which feels like 100 years ago, um, when we just had one platform, just Mac. And since then, we have iOS, iPadOS, watchOS, tvOS. So partly, I wonder, what the hell did we used to do back then? Um, but also, just I think you know, so much has changed in the developer ecosystem. But mm -hmm. the one thing that hasn't changed is the passion and the creativity of uh, our developers, and so, of course, being around entrepreneurs um, these last few days has been so exciting, just seeing what's new and, and getting that energy from all of you, so really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so, to turn it back to you. Tell us a little bit about how you got into tech, because I know it's not, not the normal path. No, it's not. I started out as an historian, came up with the idea of doing digital uh, learning materials to uh, lower primary school, secondary school, um, I started off with the first product for history teaching and um, ended up uh, doing to all the subjects, all the grades, and uh, sold the company. It was called Clio. We sold it in 2018. Congrats. Thank you. And since then, I've been investing in startups, primarily tech apps like Timo or My Money. So yeah, we, yeah. Just, we just heard from Timo this morning. I met with them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, audience. part of the Dragon's Den in Denmark now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here with me. Thank you for inviting me. Um, but Esther, you studied computer science before beginning your career as a programmer. So what was your experience as a woman in the 90s mm -hmm. in tech? In the 90s, you're kind. It was the 80s. Um, <laughs> So I started doing computer science when it was the new subject at school. Mm -hmm. um, and so we all started together. Um, an interesting fact is I went to an all-girls boarding school in England. And so when I started my career in, in technology, it was all girls. It was new. Mm -hmm. there was, it wasn't gendered in any way to me. And so that was how I sort of started and got into it. Then I went to university. There were just a handful of girls in my computer science class, but I was still surrounded by all my friends were mechanical engineers, electrical engineers. And so it wasn't really until I got into the industry, and I'm sure you have a similar experience, that I'm like, wait, where are all the girls? Why are they sitting on the sidelines? Why are they not speaking up? Why are they not volunteering? And I think that's when it really sort of struck me that, wow, things are different in industry. And I started being vocal about, hey, why aren't you doing more? And started to realize, I had to do something and have to step up and be more an active participant in making sure that that wasn't perpetuated going forward. But I started like 10 years later than that, and it was still a problem. And right. I think we are getting better, uh, being more diverse, especially within tech, uh, also in the startup. Uh, but we could be better, especially Can within be funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you're now in a senior leadership role at Apple. Tell us, how does 
Apple create a more diverse and inclusive workplace? What do you do? Yeah, so um, firstly, you know, we really do think about um, diversity and accessibility and inclusion with everything that we do. It really is where we start, it's part of our DNA. Um, and we have a corporate IND function, um, but it, within Apple, it's, it's really important and critical and, and part of our, you know, how we get graded is um, diversity and inclusion is everybody's job. And so whether, you know, that's, you know, the first level management, we report it all the way up. Um, and I think that's one of the critical things is that we're really, we're really aware of it. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that we do to make sure we're staying there is we're really, really careful and clear about our hiring practices. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that we can do in a huge business, but also when you're just starting out, it's really important to think about your hiring practices and how you go about uh, making those really, it's almost more critical when you just have a few folks. And so some of the things, sort of the practical tips are, um, you know, really looking and, um, and thinking through when you write a, a job rec and you're putting it out there, is your, is your language gendered, right? Is the way that you're suggesting things gendered? Um, the, the software you can download to, to do this work for you, but it's really important to do that work. Um, the other thing which I think is sort of overlooked sometimes is only ask on a resume for the things that you actually specifically need for that role. Um, the research shows that women are, are, are much less likely to apply for a role unless they have 100% of the requirements. Whereas men, the research is all varied, but they're, you know, men will typically apply if they have 60% of the, of the skills. Yeah. And so it's really important then to make sure that you're not overstretching because otherwise you're already going to be um, counting out some of those really fantastic women. Um, and then when it comes to actually you've got people applying, you have to sort of take it upon yourself to look at that that talent pool and say, is this good enough? Do I have diverse candidates in here? And it's not good enough anymore to say there's a pipeline issue. It's not good enough to say, hey, we didn't have any women apply. We didn't have anybody of another race apply. We have to do better. Um, and I know it's easier as a big company. It's much harder as a small company. But really think about where are you looking for those candidates? You know, it's not just the big schools. It's the community colleges. It's the vocational colleges. It's we just went and met with Hive yesterday, the coding school, um, which is really incredible, doing really incredible work. So think about where are some of those other places that you can look for really great talent. Um, and then lastly, I think something that's, that, you know, again, another important thing to remember is, you know, you can have a diverse candidate pool, you can have a great resume, but then if it's the same three white guys doing the interviewing, sorry, straight white mm -hmm. guys, but you know, we know it's about you, so it's okay. Um, but if it's, the same, if it's the same type of person doing the interviewing, then you're going to have, on, you're only going to be looking at one perspective. And so I think that's really important to remember. Um, and the other thing from, you know, a startup perspective is it's not just the right thing to do, it's imperative to your business that you have a diverse workforce. That's, you know, if you don't have a diverse mindset and a diverse set of people thinking through the problems, you're never going to have um, uh, the best product that you can have. And so it's really, it's key. Do you want to hear a funny story? Always. Um, we were like, in Clio, my former company, there were two guys and me. And uh, all our managers, it was like 50-50% women and men, of course. Uh, but once we sold the company, they had a new male CEO. And within a year, it wasn't 50-50 anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you place women in the top, right, it will show down or 100%. drill down in the organization. 100%. So it is important to hire uh, all sexes. Yeah, it's imperative. And also, I think it's important to remember, you know, I'm an ultra-feminist, obviously, but um, all women teams don't do any better than all men teams. Oh. And so, you know, that's another thing, you know, with, we're so focused on, you know, it's, it's diversity of thought and diversity of background. It's not just gender, it's gender and race and ethnicity and, you know, neurodiverse backgrounds and veteran status and so many ways to look at diversity and really just make sure that you've got alternate, you know, thinking points as, as you're ad addressing problems. Also, it, the parties are better when it's 50 /50. Parties are better, exactly. Um, Tim Cook has said that Apple can only build the best products and services by having the most diverse teams. Can you give us an example of how diversity has had an impact on Apple's approach 
to improving its user experience? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a couple of like, quick examples that come to mind are ways that women at Apple and some of the other diversity network associations or DNAs um, have helped inspire and, and um, improve our products. So um, first of all is when we were going to launch Memojis, um, we got women at Apple involved in looking at, okay, are we representative? We're gonna go from this bright yellow face with two pigtails, you know, and we're gonna move to Memojis. Are we really being represented, you know? Half the time, well, 90% of the time I wear my hair in a, in a bun because who can be bothered to do their hair every day? Um, and so it's like, oh, hey, where's my hairstyle in this Memoji? You know, and so those kinds of things is really interesting um, and ways that is, is sort of really impactful that people can make sure that they're represented, whether that's, you know, making sure that there's a hijab in different colors or whatever that, that might be. So that was one way. Um, another way from the Women at Apple perspective was um, when we launched Siri, we got all different voices and perspectives um, involved in Siri because it's really important. Women's voices typically are softer. There's a lot more pitch um, and variation in the voices. Um, we got Black at Apple involved. Black voices tend to be lower, deeper. And so we're really making sure we're, we're listening to all voices and everybody's being heard. Um, so those were a couple of the little ways. Um, one second. But some of the bigger things are, um, for example, voiceover. Um, which is, you know, was the first accessible, um, completely alternate OS um, that was that was shipped. Um, shipped actually right when I started. I can't take any credit, but um, shipped with Mac OS Tiger, um, and that was the first screen reader that was available. And so I think, you know, you start thinking about that wasn't that long ago. I mean, really, how important it was for those features. Then we announced, you know, it. it became part of uh, the iPod Shuffle, something else that was launched right when I started in January of 2005. Um, but that was the first um, time that it would, uh, a music player would speak to you and say, you know, this is whomever your favorite artist is, Taylor Swift, because I just spent $2,000 on Taylor Swift tickets. Um, I have a 19-year-old daughter, so. Mm -hmm. um, but but those, those features, so voiceover was one that really, really took off. Um, and then when we had iPhone 3GS, then we were able to include voiceover in a mobile device um, and, and some other things like Zoom and um, Color Invert. Um, another one that I think is a big one is magnifier. So I can't see past very, very far. Um, so I'm always using magnifier to look at menu rest, you know, look, look at menus in, in restaurants. Um, but because we have such a great diverse team, we're always thinking not just what's the obvious use, the magnifier, um, but what, what, where can we take it beyond that? And so um, with magnifier, there's a detection mode. Um, and what detection mode does is it enables you to do things like door detection, room detection, um, image reading, read what's actually written on, on, a, on a cue card or read what's written on a door. And so those, those are taken so much further. Um, with door detection, you can hold up your iPad and, and it will tell you, you know, the door is coming up and it's on your left and it's a button or it's coming up and it's on your right and you have to turn the handle. Some of those things which, if we didn't have a diverse set of folks thinking through these problems, we would never have gotten to that level of depth of the, of the features. But that's what I love about technology. Um, both of my cousins are dyslexic. dyslexic. Oh, yeah. And uh, I read or saw in the news that this uh, Dutch guy invented a new font for dyslexic. Wow. And we introduced it in our digital learning platform Excellent. to switch on so that all the text was in this special font so the dyslexic had a better time reading the text in school. So that's the best part about totally. technology. Yeah. 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 Okay. Apple has uh, invested in programs like Entrepreneur Camp, which aims to support people from underrepresented backgrounds to build better apps and grow their businesses. First, please explain what is Entrepreneur Camp, and second, what is the most common feedback you get from these participants? Okay. Um, so if you don't know, Apple Entrepreneur Camp is um, it's an immersive technology lab for our underrepresented founders. So we actually started it for female founders, um, but recently, in the last 18 months, we've included cohorts for black founders and Hispanic and Latinx founders. Um, and it's, it's really, um, it's, it's been groundbreaking for the developers that have come through. We've had developers from 30 countries come through the program. Um, and what's different about it is it's not a, um, 
I mean, in the startup world, there's a lot of people that will help you with your business pitch and that kind of thing. We do that as well, but we're also deep in the code. You bring your app um, to Entrepreneur Camp virtually, but you bring it. Um, and we, we, we open your code and you sit there with technical engineers and we help you figure out where are you wrong. If you're having a trouble uh, implementing metal, we'll bring in the metal engineer and he'll sit with you and figure out, or she will sit with you, I should say, um, and figure out how to, how to solve your problem. So um, it's a really technical lab. Um, it lasts for a week. And once the lab is finished, then we help with demos. We rehearse your demo pitch as if you're coming on stage with Tim Cook um, so that when someone stops you in a hallway like this, you have your 30-second pitch, your one-minute pitch ready to go. Um, and so it's, it's, really, it's really been great. And that alumni network now is growing, and we're really seeing a positive change from that. And some of the companies that have come through have been found, have been you know, bought. Um, they've won huge grants. So we're, we're continuously seeing success. So that's what it is. Um, and as far as your question about what's the reaction, the, the feedback, yeah, I think... Um, there's two main, two main things that come out of it. One is this sense of overwhelm that companies get when they, they come to Apple and they realize Apple seems to be this huge conglomerate that is, is impenetrable, but really we're just a, a group of people that are desperate to help. And I think you know, the, the team is here in the audience today, so um, we're here to help, we really are. Um, but I think that's what, what is the most um, overwhelming to folks is just how much of a difference we can make. And just in that, in that reaching out and being part of the story, um, it really helps with confidence. A lot of times what we hear is, you know, especially for sole founders or smaller companies where you're still not sure and you haven't quite got to market yet, um, is are we doing the right thing? And then when they're going to, to meet with VCs, it's this extra level of confidence where it's not like, um, I have to tell you about my pitch and I'm not really sure and maybe you don't want it. It's no, you know what? I got selected by Apple and I went to this camp and I sat with the App Store folks and they told me this is the right monetization path for my app. And it gives you that sort of sense of confidence of, yeah, the App Store team is behind me. They're going to help me. We're going to be successful. And boom, then it really, really takes off. So that's the positive. We're always thinking about how we can do better. But one thing... Um, that always strikes me, every single camp that we've had, every single cohort, is this just inherent sense of imposter syndrome. It's every camp, it's like, oh, we thought you meant the other Blue Sky app. That, it's like, no, it's you. Or, you know, and people do this sort of self-deprecating humor, but it's every cohort, and we wait for it. It's like, who's gonna do it first, you know? Okay. Um, and so, you know, it means that we've got work to do for a lifetime. Um, but, it, but it's interesting, and so I think the one thing that I would say for, for startups that are here is, you know, just be, just be bold and be brave and, and know that it is you we're after, and it, and it is you we called, and it is you we accepted, and that everyone deserves a chance at this success and to be part of this amazing opportunity that is the App Store. Well, actually, my former company, My Inner Me, which was an app for uh, youngsters having a hard time or... Mm -hmm a psychology lab, uh, app, we were chosen to be on some of your camps and it was really good because you get, gave us a lot of information on how to improve our onboarding and mm -hmm. which markets to enter. It was very, very informative. Well, good, I like that. And we also had this imposter syndrome, I think, but it was just like, oh, they chose us <laughs> right. among all and it was amazing and of course it helped a lot. It improved. Also, right. Timo that I've invested in, you've made a huge... Second shout out for Timo, yeah. I like it. <laughs> they, you made a huge difference for them. Oh, so good. Love to hear and that. I love it because it is uh, neurodiversion uh, people Correct. using yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So Awesome. Speaking to the topic. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Many people here today may be wondering how they can improve diversity in their organizations. Right. Do you have any advice or easy steps they can take, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this is the, the million dollar question, right? It's what can I do today? And so I would say the first thing to do is to measure. You can't judge success of any kind without knowing where you start. And so, you know, in a huge company that's, you know, writing scripts to figure out who's got what and which groups as you put them together are how diverse, but you know, in a small company, it's like man, woman, man, woman, okay, who's next, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think measuring is really, really critical. The second thing um, is to make it everyone's job, right? It, it, 
make inclusion and diversity part of everyone's, you know, the way that everyone is graded um, as a manager, as, a, as an employee, how inclusive are they being? Um, thirdly, I would say, um, it's not about just diversity. You, you hear like inclusion and diversity, inclusion and diversity, but it's like slow that down. It's the inclusion part, right? It's, it, that's what's critical. It's, we could have everyone in this room, but if I'm only asking one really smart guy in the front row, that's only one opinion that I have. So you have to ask and you have to solicit all of those opinions. And it, it's hard, right? We're going really fast. At Apple, we're going lightning speed. And so it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to sort of take that step back and say like, oh, I'm sorry, Louise, did you, did you participate in this? What were you thinking? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's, that's critical. The things that we've already talked about, the hiring practices, yeah. you know, really thinking about the way that you write your resumes and resumes, your uh, recs. I'm not writing my resume, just to be clear. Um, the way that you write your recs, the way that you're interviewing people, the interviewer panel, those things. Um, and, and a good acronym, just to remember quickly, I think, is IDEA, you know, the word IDEA, but inclusion, diversity, equity. Are you paying equally for equal work? It's critical. Um, if you want to do, to get anywhere, we have to, you know, we have to be um, equal in the way that we pay our workforce. And then the A for idea is action. Take action, do something, whatever that is, whether it's start today and measure, look at, you know, download the software to see how, you're, how you write your recs and are they gendered. Mm -hmm. Think about, okay, how can I make everyone do something? How can I cross-pollinate across my organization so that different people are, you know, participating in different ways? It's not just that same group think. It's much easier than, than you think. Um, my team has been with me for a long time. A core of us have been together for over 10 years. And so a lot of times that's a great thing. I know them inside out, but I know them inside out. And that's not a great thing, right? So when new people come in, um, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, especially students will sort of shrink in the back and be like, oh, I don't know anything. And it's like, no, no, you are the one that has the new perspective. That's, that's what we're looking for today is like, tell me something I don't know. And so everyone has something to share. I think um, a lot of startups, um, when they're looking for new employees like uh, developers, and you have a talent pool that is like 95% male right. and 5% women, you can always have this sentence in your head like, hire for attitude, train for skills. That's a great one. So maybe, you know, right. to get more diversity, mm -hmm. and if, if the minority is not good enough, then teach them, yeah. co-teach them, like employees can help each other. Mm -hmm. 100%. Um, and so. and what, what do you look for when you're investing in a company? Are you look, what are you looking for in that way? It's the same problem. I want to have a 50-50 split, but sometimes that's all I get pitches from men. Right. So send pitches for me. Send pitches. If you're a Louise's woman, money is burning a hole in her pocket. She wants to invest yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. I uh, will have amazing. the 50-50 yeah. percent. Yep. Yeah. We'll get there. But among the audience, there are probably many um, great female entrepreneurs and developers. Is there anything Guaranteed. in the end you want to tell them? Um, I mean, I think there's two things. The way I say it is um, think nothing of your gender and think everything of your gender. Like, think nothing in that we're all just individual people. We all have individual experiences uh, and knowledge. And, you know, don't do this whole, like, think like a man thing. That's nonsense. But... Um, so think nothing of your gender, but then on the other hand, think everything of your gender. Your gender is what makes you different. It's what makes you valuable because you have a different perspective. Even if you have had a bad experience with your, with, you know, your gender experience in technology, you can use that for good and you can use that to propel your team forward. You can know what things you want to do better. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice. What about you? What would be your biggest piece of advice? I think it's just be role models so a lot of others get inspired, both men and women. Um, that's why I said yes to participating in uh, Dragon's Den. I'm actually a very private person, but I think we have to have people to show this is totally. another way of, right. of doing it. Yep. So be role models and um, yeah. I love it. Well, thank you, everyone. We um, have to wrap this up. Yeah. Um, it's been really special for us. Um, for me, it's my first time at, um, at Slush, but also my first time in Finland. And 
Love it. Um, got to take a sauna yesterday, which was amazing, so I'm coming back. Um, but really just wanted to say thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure to be here. Um, met so many amazing developers. I mean, really, we met with uh, Walt yesterday morning, and I swear that somebody is planting a Volt bag anywhere I go, there's something. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got to meet the, pres uh, the, the president, prime minister, prime minister yesterday. Yes, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, so thank yeah. you for that. So. She's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise, obviously. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sticking around. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>